What about secondary patents? Yes. What do you say about those? These are patents generally you find that there is no innovation, there is yes. no newness, there mm -hmm. is no novelty, but and there is no other application like industrial or agriculture application, but people claim that we have no v innovated. So if you don't have substantive search and examination, it's difficult. That's why in South Africa we have the depository system and then we are not trained scientifically to examine those issues. Well, how come and then we are saying we need to move to substantive search and examination so that we can see whether there is novelty in this new thing. And how come that in India they were able to do that? There's a very important Supreme Court of yes, India decision yeah, of this year, yeah. which in fact exposed mm. the manipulations of yes, pharmaceutical yes, yes, companies. Yes, yes. How come they were able to do that? And say, I'm awfully sorry, yes, that's yes. not a new medicine. Yes, you are right. It's better to say, government, you have taken a, a, a good direction because we are following what Brazil, India, and uh, say Argentina and other developing countries. Are you going to be doing that? what they we do? are going to okay. do that? Now, what's wrong with that? I mean, the Indian Supreme Court. I don't know if you're aware of this. Case. I'm aware of the case. Okay, it's a very interesting judgment, mm. and its basic line is: all you do is you tweak the medicine, you then <coughs> claim it's new, and then you then want the patents as a result of which you can charge whatever price you want to. What the Indian Supreme Court said, that's not a new medicine. And number two, it's subverting basically the provision of medicine in the country that needs it. And it's not doing anything about innovation because actually all you've done is revamped old goods. I should have an easy time of it discussing this with the judge. That is the right place for the decision to be made. The but law you should state that that's, Yes, the law that. should state a principle mm. and then the court should apply the principle. Now let me just mention, for example, a, a treatment called chlor, uh, chlorpromazine. Now I'll just give you its history, just to understand the logic of secondary patents to which South Africa agrees, subject to the idea that it must be bona fide. And th that, in my view, is a court decision. It started off as a, as a waste product of the dye industry. It was then found to be an antiseptic and marketed and patented as such. It was then found to be anti-malarial. The same product, same substance. Then it was found to uh, be a, a anesthesiology uh, treatment. Then it was found in its fifth uh, incarnation uh, to be a very effective antipsychotic treatment in psychiatry. So here is something that because it was able to go through, somebody does new research with an existing product at very great cost, billions of dollars, and says we have found that this thing that was originally a waste product of the dye industry can in fact treat malaria. Then they say well, we've done more research and what we found it can treat this and that. So we need to understand that if you want that sort of innovation <coughs> and research to occur with pre-existing products, then you need to protect the secondary patent. Well, for how long? And secondly, who pays the cost of this? I mean, I'm intrigued by this. Let me tell you why. Because it's well known that in certain patents, the intellectual, the cost of the intellectual capital that goes is often paid by the state through universities, through subsidies, through a whole range of other breaks. It's not a question only of the private company doing it. So with this question of this return that you're talking about that the private company requires, is itself a contested area? Well, no, th that's actually a contract. And, and MacDonald is very familiar with how you enter into contracts with research institutes. And well, if you use public is, funds, is McDonald is, is the architect of South Africa's very sophisticated policy on the use of public funds yeah, for research yeah. and innovation. But once you've got that, then your argument about how critical it is that the innovation has to be given as much leeway as possible because of the return, then has to be tested against yes, and if the, the taxpayer, money. If you know? the taxpayer of South Africa funds the innovation, then the taxpayer of South Africa should have the patent rights worldwide. All right. So, so Marcus, <laughs> what do you say about the fact that you do get an evolving, Leon's example, of an evolving patent, and, and it, it's, it's a, effectively a new product then? And you well, I think he, he kind of, I think he cherry-picked his example. Um, in our experience with AIDS drugs, we had cancer medicines um, like AZT, which were developed in the 60s. They were repainted patented in the late 80s um, for um, treatment of HIV. And essentially, the amount of research that went on into that transfer into to using it for HIV was not that much. Most of it was paid for through the state, as you suggested. But then that patent blocked access 
to AIDS treatment for millions of patients. So the impact is in real lives, and I think there's, there is a careful balance that we have to maintain. And how do you strike that but balance? I think, I think balance, that's what we're talking about. How do you strike that? Well, firstly, let me just deal with the innovation argument, because yes. The Gleevec, the drug in the Indian Supreme Court case, um, the company who owns the patent, Novartis, only spent $96 million developing that drug. Last year, they earned $2.4 billion from that drug. So they recoup their investment every 13 days. Um, and at the same time, there were people with cancer who can't access that drug. So there's a clear imbalance in a system that allows that to happen. That it's clearly not a patent that serves the public interest. So in our view, we should reject new use patents and new formulation patents. Um, but how, what do you, how, do you respond, Indian law, how do you respond to the fact that, that there's an acceptance through the WTO that the patent should last for 20 years, and in terms of that patent, you're entitled to use it for that 20 years, and... and uh, and it's extraordinarily difficult for governments or indeed courts to start deciding what price is the correct price or not the correct price, as the case may be. Well, the key is what's in the public interest. So if patients are dying, um, right now there are patients in Kailicha um, who need a TB drug called linazolid. Doctors from MSF have to pay 700 rand per pill. They can only afford to treat 22 patients. There are 300 patients who need that drug. So they have to decide who gets that drug and who gets to live. So that's clearly an unacceptable um, situation. So in clear humanitarian cases like that, I think government should intervene. Um, and our current law makes it difficult for government to issue compulsory licenses. Are you saying we don't have the correct framework at present? Yes. Our okay. framework for compulsory licensing has not been um, updated all since the Doha Declaration in 2001. Okay. So we can extend the criteria and we can make the process clearer so that it's not stuck I've got, in I've got, I've got a, a member time. of the DTI who wants to say something, but I've got to take a break first and then we'll give him an opportunity. News that moves. ENCA.com.